Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Ashman Family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Ashman Family JCC empowers you to experience Jewish paths toward a life of joy, purpose, and meaning through innovative Jewish learning and wellness programs, community building, and initiatives to develop the next generation of Jewish leaders. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 418, Prophetic Judaism. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rofberg. And today we are so excited to be speaking again with Nate DeGroot. He's the associate director of the Shalom Center, and we're going to be talking about working toward liberation for all through a mobilization of Jewish traditions. Before we do that, just a final reminder that the latest round of classes at the Unyeshiva, our digital center for Jewish learning and unlearning, are starting in just a couple of days after this episode is released. If you want to sign up before the classes start, head over to judaismunbound.com classes and check out the five amazing classes that are on offer. Last week, we talked to Laura Duhan Kaplan, who's teaching a class called Reimagining Biblical Animals Beyond the Talking Donkey. And we also talked last week with Yosef Rosen, who will be teaching Fire and Rain, Magical and Mythic Jewish Ecologies for Climate Crises. In addition to that, our old friend Kashira Halev Fife is back teaching Fractals in Jewish Time, a creative exploration of Jewish time and rituals. And Lex here is teaching Jubilees, a gateway into Jewish Apocrypha. Last but not least is me. I am going to be co-teaching a class with our executive director, Miriam Turlenchamp, called Judaism Inbound, a new kind of introduction to Jewish practice and life. It's for any of you out there that are considering conversion to Judaism and you want an intro to Judaism class, or for those of you out there who are already Jewish but feel like you don't really know much about Judaism and an intro would help you a lot too. We had students of both of those descriptions last year, and it was an awesome experience for all of us. We can't wait to teach it again, hopefully this time with you. And it's important to note that financial aid is available for all the classes, And if you don't personally need financial aid, but you'd like to help us provide it to others, there's also an opportunity when you're registering for a class to say that you'd like to make an additional contribution to help make our classes accessible for everyone. And if you're not registering for a class, I don't know why you're not registering for a class, but if you're not and you still want to help people with financial aid, you can just head over to judaismunbound.com slash donate to make a donation to Judaism Unbound and that will help us make everything that we do accessible. So again, that's judaismunbound.com slash classes to check out all of these wonderful opportunities and to sign up. Speaking of building a world that is more accessible and just for everyone, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today with Nate DeGroot. Nate DeGroot joined us back in episode 320, along with Madeline Canfield, where we looked at how the Shalom Center along with some other organizational partners like the Jewish Youth Climate Movement, were channeling Passover as a moment to work toward climate justice. Since then, Nate DeGroote's role at the Shalom Center has grown, and the Shalom Center's work of channeling Jewish holidays toward justice work has expanded. So just a few more words of introduction about our guest today. Nate DeGroote is the Associate Director for the Shalom Center, where he helps support the creation and activation of the organization's new strategic vision. At the request of Arthur Waskow, one of our former guests on Judaism Unbound and the founder of the Shalom Center, Nate DeGroote anticipates succeeding him as director of the Shalom Center in January of 2025. Before coming to the Shalom Center, Nate DeGroote served as Associate Director, Spiritual, and Program Director at Hazon, which is now called Adama, and he was the inaugural Jewish Emergent Network Rabbinic Fellow at IKAR in Los Angeles. Nate DeGroote has rabbinical ordination from Hebrew College, and he lives in Detroit, Michigan, where he also serves as a part-time congregational rabbi. Nate DeGroote, welcome back to Judaism Unbound. It's so great to have you again. Thank you so much for having me. Thrilled to be here. Well, so this is an interesting moment that we, I'm trying to think if we've had a guest on before that's kind of been in this particular situation. I don't think so. 
where it is somebody who is kind of about to take to take on the responsibility of leading a, an organization that's been around for a pretty long time. It, it's actually, we know it's been 40 years because we just celebrated the Shalom Center's 40 Fest not too long ago. And one of the things that we wanted to get an insight into a little bit is how that happens, particularly when it's an organization. It's not like, yeah, you know, there's probably a lot of Jewish federations or Hillel's or other kinds of organizations like that. There's a lot of older organizations, synagogues that are always getting new leadership. And that's an interesting thing in its own right. But for me, the Shalom Center represents the oldest or one of the oldest of what I think of as the newer Jewish organizations that are the kinds that we tend to be talking about here on Judaism Unbound. And yet it's actually been around for 40 years, which is a very important Jewish number. And so I'm particularly interested in what does it look like to come in and lead an older organization that's still kind of like, you know, actually countercultural? Yeah, well, thanks for the question. So I think it's helpful maybe to ground in our founder and current director's story a little bit to kind of understand where we are and where we're going. Arthur Waskow, decades before he was rabbi, Arthur Waskow was in D.C. when Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and killed. He was part of an uprising that was happening there in response to that. When the police and tanks and and jeeps with guns rolled in and the first night of Passover rolls around and Arthur starts walking home for Seder and passes by a jeep with a gun pointing down his block. And it occurs to Arthur Waskow at that time, 1968, uh, not particularly uh, involved with Judaism or committed to Judaism in different ways, more of a cultural Jew Why am I walking home for Passover Seder when Pharaoh's army is right here in the streets? That was the kind of revelatory moment for Arthur that showcased for him how Judaism is not just a religion or tradition or set of texts of the past, but relevant and critical to the moment, whichever moment it is. And the following year, uh, Arthur and a bunch of other colleagues and co-conspirators created the first Freedom Seder, the original Freedom Seder. The first time it it seems that uh, Passover, Haggadah, Passover Seder included the liberation narrative of uh, people other than the Jews or in addition to the Jews, uh, civil rights based. And this really kicked off the decades since of, of fusing Judaism and activism, of trying to get at what are the most relevant kernels, values, directions that our tradition has to respond to the current moment. The Shalom Center was founded in 1983 of the moment in response to the nuclear movement and the specter of nuclear war and uh, uh, really born out of an anti-nuclearization effort. And for 40 years now, the Shalom Center has been trying to respond to the moment in that fusion of Judaism and justice. And, And that's really what we're trying to do going forward is to honor that legacy, to build on that legacy, and also to notice and respond to what are the unique qualities of this moment in history that demand a prophetic voice and prophetic response. So how does that connect to your story? I mean, not only like your origin story, but also your the origin story that you're writing right now, your origin as the leader of the Shalom Center, like what's, what is it like, how does one pick up an organization that was founded out of a, a really particular story of a particular man like that? Yeah, I would, uh, I would venture to say that we are in the early stages of Judaism's fourth era. I know there's some debate and even on your podcast of what era of Judaism we're in or how many there have been. I would say that Judaism began in the wilderness, that wilderness Judaism was our first era, that temple Judaism was our second era. And as the temple was being destroyed and Jews were trying to pick up the pieces and and reimagine what Jewish life would look like going forward, rabbinic Judaism was born. We're now over 2,000 years or around 2,000 years into rabbinic Judaism. And at this time in history, we are entering into a new era of Judaism, what we're calling prophetic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism was a response in many ways, not not entirely, but in many ways to the destruction of the temple. And, and we're saying that prophetic Judaism, the emergence of prophetic Judaism, is a response in many ways to the destruction of temple earth. 
uh, in terms of the climate crisis, but also in terms of all of the kind of foundational shifts that we're experiencing under our feet, globalization, the way in which we understand that we are a single community uh, of humans and the more than human world. And as the volatility is increasing, this becomes right what uh, Rabbi Benny Lapier refers to as a crash moment. If, if the destruction of the temple was a crash moment for the people of that time, then the destruction of Temple Earth, the kind of reconfiguration of Temple Earth and our global society, I would say is a crash moment of our time. And what the Shalom Center is trying to do is respond to that crash moment, respond to those shifts. So really the opportunity of coming into the Shalom Center is this opportunity to both carry forth the legacy of our founder and also to redefine and expand it, to recognize that in this day and age, what prophetic looks like is going to be different than what it looked like 10, 40, 70, or 2,000 years ago. Uh, We live in this globalized world uh, where leaderful movements are proving to be more effective, um, that we're not focusing in on a particular prophetic character or a particular prophetic voice, but how are we surfacing and kind of democratizing what prophecy looks like for a contemporary Jewish community? How are we tapping into the prophetic wisdom of our tradition and then applying it more broadly and holistically? So I'm asking this question as a new board member of the Shalom Center, which is very exciting. The Shalom Center has this long legacy and is, as you said and Dan said, is at this inflection point. I think a 40-year anniversary is always going to be a check-in moment and a moment to turn a page and look forward. But it's also a moment of passing leadership, of drastically changing dynamics in the world. What is starting to look different in 2024 into the coming years? And also, what is sort of the heartbeat that is absolutely not going to be different? Like, can you can you take us into the pieces of the Shalom Center that have been there and will always be there versus maybe some programmatic pieces, some structural pieces, um, forms of leadership that you started to talk about that are a little newer? Great. So there's this idea in chemistry that uh, when you have a super saturated solution and you drop a single seed crystal into that solution, that the whole thing crystallizes. And that's how Arthur really understands that original freedom Seder. And that's what's staying the same is we're seeking out what are those seed crystals in the context of the super saturated solution that can crystallize the whole thing? What are the moments, the touch points, the opportunities to engage the broader Jewish world and beyond? to transform society, transform uh, what sacred justice can look like, transform kind of what it it means to be Jewish in in this time. How we're doing that is going to look pretty different. There's a real emphasis on honing in on particular activities that we can do uh, related to holidays, what are referred to as as activists, as, as we've heard, activist festivals, a way to embody the Jewish holidays and the Jewish calendar cycle in a way that transforms society for good. We are- To clarify, for good in the sense of for the better and also for good as in like forever. I like, I think it's <laughs> appropriate that that phrase means two different right. things. Right. I mean, at least maybe for a while, I think I would shy away from saying anything is forever. The rabbinic Judaism folks would say that rabbinic Judaism was going to be forever. And here we, here we are with the crash moment. So <laughs> I won't go that far, but certainly for good in terms of the well-being of our community, the well-being of our people and the well-being of our world. Arthur's best-selling book is Seasons of Our Joy. And when I asked him why he thought it was his best-selling book, his answer was really interesting and instructive to me, which was, his belief, and and I share this, that Jewish holidays are the things that at least North American Jews have most in common with each other across all sorts of differences and backgrounds and practices and beliefs, regardless of someone's approach to Jewish law, Jewish practice, observance of commandments, theology, even cultural roots, that most people, we would venture to say, that have some kind of touch point with Judaism, have some kind of touch point with Jewish holidays. And it allows for this um, kind of collective uh, mobilization or orientation around the the festivals and the the holidays. We've seen holidays be celebrated personally in homes and with families for thousands of years. We've seen holidays be celebrated in synagogues or communal spaces. Uh, We've seen holidays being celebrated on city streets, a big candle lighting you know, in the center of town. And there have been far fewer examples of holidays that have been celebrated on a national 
scale on the ground in a, in a way that's uh, strategic and seeking to shift power and transform conditions for for people. And, and that's what we're really leaning into. Uh, certainly, there have been initiatives like that across the country here and there, but not necessarily coordinated, not necessarily in the rhythm of the annual calendar where holidays are coming basically every month and it's an ongoing kind of spiral. You all have done incredible work in the virtual space and others in the digital space of bringing people together for holidays. And what does it look like to do that on the ground? That's strategically what we're what we're focusing in on. So I love this image of the or this metaphor of the supersaturated solution. And I did take you know some college classes in chemistry, so you know I'm, I'm aware of what you're talking about. But could you describe like what is the supersaturated solution? Like we're understanding that the the crystal that you're putting in is the holiday experience, and we'll get into that more later. Like what does that look like? But what is the supersaturated crystallization look like? What is, what is it that you're trying to achieve as that result of the the crystal being put into the solution? Yeah, so let me maybe back up a, a little bit to get to that answer. We are in what I would call uh, hashtag late stage rabbinic Judaism um, at the the end of this kind of arc of of a multi thousand year era, and in its kind of contemporary version, the primary organizing apparatus for the Jewish community spiritually, I would say, is probably synagogues. And I think it's interesting to look back at the history of synagogues or modern history of synagogues in this country. And I think that kind of helps us uh, look into the future of what organizing structures for Judaism could look like. At the turn of the 20th century, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, I would say that the two primary kind of reasons for a synagogue or the two primary things that were trying to be achieved through the synagogue are um, community, all right, and it's early formations, maybe like the eight people from the shtetl that you are specifically from, and over generations that has expanded out into um, geographical location or values-based or suburban towns or, or whatnot. Community amongst Jews, amongst uh, like-minded people, amongst people that wanted to be together. And then the other is safety. And I think primarily for a long time, it's been safety from non-Jews, safety from anti-Semitism. And I would say that in that kind of foundational shift that we're going through right now, the kind of uh, temple earth destruction and reconfiguration, those two needs are still prevalent and critical. But how we understand them and come to define them and come to practice them, I would say look really different. I think we need to begin to define community differently, that it's not just Jews, and it's not even just all humans, but all of life, that we are, as Dr. King said in the last essay of the last book that was published before he was murdered, that we live in a world house, and it's up to us to figure out how to live together. I think we're seeing that in the climate crisis and other crises that we're facing. So how we define community has to look different. And in terms of safety, I think we're coming to grapple with what safety for Jews looks like and the possibility that our safety is located in solidarity and relationship amongst all of those who are targeted by empire and amongst all of us who are facing these kinds of existential threats. So that's some of the uh, context of this supersaturated solution that we're trying to wrestle with, this balance between the particularist and the universalist, how we as Jews are, are supposed to engage in a world where we are holding both the uniqueness of who we are and also trying to be participating in a global reality that is um, trying to thrive and, and seeking a kind of wholeness, you know, that kind of lends itself to shalom, wholeness, shlemut. Um, so that's kind of the supersaturated solution and how we respond those are the the seed crystals that we're seeking to experiment with. But I think my question is, what is the crystallized solution? Or the, I don't know what you call that. Like after the solution like? crystallizes, what is the future world that you're trying to bring about? Sure. I, I mean, I think without dodging the question, I think that's partially uh, that democratization of, of vision. I don't think, you know, that's up for me to to determine. I think that's a collective process. But at the center of it, a world where where everyone uh, experiences dignity, where there's the possibility of of thriving, where where we're living in a culture and reality of abundance, in, in a world where we're not uh, seeking power or domination or violence, in a world where we're not experiencing the kind of separation from that I would say has led to so much of the pain and the the crisis and the tragedy that we experience in the world today. So I really love the framework you're bringing around holidays and how you spoke about seasons of our joy and how across difference holidays really are sort of 
the piece that most connects Jews. I'm I'm so convinced by that. It feels deeply true to me. I like I've felt a deep connection to holidays for many years. I haven't had the language to quite put it that way, but I think that's exactly it. And I want to think about what holidays are and what they do. Because I think what Arthur did with Freedom Seder, we take it for granted now, but it it was revolutionary because as I think about it, holidays so often and to some extent still People experience them, and Abraham Joshua Heschel used this kind of language as like a cathedral in time. He talks about Shabbat that way, but he like as a space that you inhabit. I think what Arthur did with the Freedom Seder is he said, no, it's not that holidays are just a space. It's that they're a vector. They're something that is channeled into the world. For a long time, I think if you had asked people like, yo, want to do a protest for some cause that you like, like not one that you don't like, create an action, whatever, on Passover, they'd say, like, why would I do that? Like, Passover has a set of things, and I sort of enter into that space. And when I do those wonderful actions and rallies, it's sort of between the holidays. And I might even do it as a Jew. I might think of it as channeling my Jewish values, but I'm less likely to do it on a holiday because the holidays sort of have their their thing. But what the revolutionary move was, was to say, the thing of Passover isn't sitting in a room at a Seder and doing the steps, wine and parsley and the Seder plate and whatever, the thing is that there's a story of freedom and liberation, and you experience it and you embody it wherever there is a fight for freedom and liberation. So scheduling a rally on Passover, that's not disrespectful to Passover. That is the actual thing. Like that, that If you're not doing that, then maybe you're not really doing Passover, is the sort of sense I get. And so... I'd love to hear more from you. Is this a helpful framework of thinking of holidays, not just as sort of a space in time, as sort of a point on the graph, but rather as a vector on the graph, as something that has momentum and direction that we channel into the world to try to impact that world? I think absolutely. I think to the extent that we understand Judaism as an aspirational world building project, then we're not there yet, right? We haven't we haven't reached the destination. Is that even possible? Moses doesn't make it into the promised land. We start back over at the beginning. That's maybe a different question. But if we understand Judaism as a prompt to engage in the world and try to make the world a better place, then I absolutely think that holidays are a vector pointing us in that direction. Judaism becomes a religion that is alive and responsive, again, to the moment, to the times. I grew up in a suburb in Massachusetts, uh, a fairly rural street where we couldn't see our closest neighbor. Um, On Passover, we would open the front door and we would shout out, let all who are hungry come eat. And literally not a single person could hear our invitation, never mind, take us up on it, right? This is a traditional invocation, invitation that we're supposed to make at Passover according to our tradition. But it was purely symbolic. It was purely performative because there wasn't actually a stranger with an earshot who could respond to this invitation. And yet the seeds of that invitation, the practical implications of that invitation are uh, wildly radical, like transformative. If we actually took that seriously and engaged in a project where Passover included an invitation for all who are hungry to come and eat together, that really changes the way that we understand Passover, the impact that Passover can have, the transformative nature on us as individuals, us as a community, us as a world. So absolutely, that's what we're aiming towards is What are the kernels? What are the underlying values? What's the essence of the holiday or the essences of the holiday? And how do we actually embody those to be building the world that we want to see? So do you have a theory of how the holidays work? In other words, like, is every holiday different? I guess the options are every holiday is different, it's structured differently, it's for a different purpose. Option number two is... The holidays have a common structure, a common process, and then each holiday's substance is different. Option three, and maybe there are more options, is no, they're all actually the same. They're the same, same structurally. They're the same content-wise. They're all trying to do the same thing. That's why we have one every month because we know we have Shabbat every week. That's trying to do one thing. We have holidays every month because that's trying to do another thing. And I guess I'm asking like, how whatever theory you have connects into the, the work that you imagine the holidays doing. Yeah, I really see the Jewish year cycle, the Jewish calendar cycle as kind of ebbing and flowing with personality and texture. We are such an earth-based people. Our holidays, by and large, are deeply connected 
to the lands in which they were uh, originally celebrated and observed, tied to historical moments, tied to texts and uh, histories that I really believe that each one has its own unique essence. And the way that we embody that holiday, the activists that we design and, and execute for those holidays, I think will, will look really different. I think it's trying to not map on some kind of external value or goal or project onto the holiday and and try to just kind of layer it on and say, now do this on this holiday just because it's a convenient time or just because Jews are used to celebrating or observing this date uh, for a particular reason. But actually the inverse of that, really beginning with the holiday and saying, what does this holiday demand of us? What does this season demand of us? What are the opportunities that come, that that open up because of the kind of spiritual ramifications, the layers of meaning of thousands of years that present themselves to us? And what is what is our opportunity and what what is our responsibility, the kind of spiritual necessity to embody that holiday as fully as possible? Yeah, I mean, what you're saying reminds me of something that I think a lot of people don't really know, haven't heard about. You know, there's a story in the Talmud of the essentially the primordial Hanukkah, you know, that people think of Hanukkah as the most recent of Jewish holidays and the least important of Jewish holidays. And the Talmud actually puts out an idea that Hanukkah was the first of the holidays because what happened was that Adam was understanding that the days were getting shorter and shorter and thought that maybe the world was going to end. And then the days started getting longer and longer. And he, and he realized the world is not going to end and he celebrated. And that became kind of, a, a you know, what, what it's about. And, you know, then only thousands and thousands, I mean, depending on how much of a creationist you are, you know, um, sometime in the future, that day was given a different valence by the story of Hanukkah as we know it. But I'm curious if you could go into more some examples maybe of of how you think about some of the holidays and what they're really about. Yeah, and I appreciate the the prompt around Hanukkah too, right? It's what what we're trying to do is in one sense new and radical and in another sense is completely aligned with Jewish tradition, which has repurposed, reimagined holidays all along as you just described with Hanukkah for Shavuot which seems to originally have been uh, a grain holiday, the priest lifting up uh, freshly baked loaves of bread with the first grains of the season. And only later, it seems the rabbis added on layers of uh, the revelation of Torah at Mount Sinai, those kinds of things. So this is a project that the Jewish people have been engaged in seemingly forever of re-understanding, turning and turning again the holidays to um, have them be most relevant to uh, to the moment. And you know, one example that that to me really stands out is Yom Kippur. The prophetic reading, the Haftarah uh, of Yom Kippur comes from Isaiah. And those of us who show up to synagogue and those of us who fast are sitting there listening to this text from Isaiah where he's channeling God. And through Isaiah, God is saying, is this the fast you think I desire? Is this what you think you should be doing on this holiest day of the year is not eating food? And, you know, maybe I would add in parentheses, sitting sitting in shul, sitting in synagogue, zoning out or taking your bathroom break or kibitzing, talking with the person next to you or whatever the case might be. God through Isaiah says, no, this is not what the purpose of the holiest day of your year is, the kind of pinnacle moment of your year. Actually, the point is to make sure the people who are hungry are fed, to make sure that people who don't have adequate clothing have clothes to wear, that people who don't have stable and secure housing actually have a roof over their head and don't fear being evicted from from their house. It's actually to break the chains of oppression. I mean, this is the fast that I desire, God says through Isaiah. If you were an outsider, you had no framework of Yom Kippur, no understanding of contemporary American Judaism, and you read that text and you were told, this is the text that we read on our holiest day of the year. What do you think we do on our holiest day of the year? I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who says, oh, you probably sit in rows and chairs or on pews and you listen to this read to you and you just kind of nod your head or zone out or just, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm being scolded, but I'm going to keep doing what I do. Right. So what would it look like if instead there were this is the fast gatherings happening in synagogue parking lots or public spaces uh, across the country where there was home cooked food for anyone who needed it? And thrift store style clothes racks where you could walk up and get whatever you needed. And there were a group of plumbers and electricians and carpenters uh, with a clipboard and you could walk up and sign up for a home repair and they'd come in the ensuing months to make sure that you could stay in your home, right? What would that 
do to the Jewish psyche? What would that do to the world around us? How does that fit what the message of Yom Kippur is in a more authentic, maybe, or uh, embodied or uh, principled way, perhaps, than um, kind of the tradition that we've inherited at this stage of things? I'm really appreciative of you bringing up Yom Kippur. It connects to what you said about the early founding of synagogues and sort of what we see Jewish stuff as being for. If you ask a lot of people what they value about Yom Kippur, I think a lot of them talk about being with other Jews. And that's not bad. But like, when I ask people like, what's powerful about Yom Kippur, they don't usually start with, well, there's this liturgical thing, or Isaiah 58, that Haftorah reading, or like, it's... You know, I go to synagogue and it's one of the few times all year that I'm like in a big crew of Jews and I don't only feel like I am different from most people in society. Um, I share certain foods at breakfast afterwards. There are people that have a connection to certain liturgical things of Yom Kippur, but I think we've so thoroughly ingrained in ourselves that the main thing of Jewish holidays is that you gather with Jews. It's actually more like that's more what every holiday is. I mean, going to Dan's question before about are the holidays kind of different or the same? I think for a lot of people, the primary thing that is happening at every single Jewish holiday, independent of its particular valence, is that you get in a room with other Jews and most of the rest of your life, you're with largely people who are not Jewish. And I don't think that's what the holidays are actually trying to be and do. And I think that especially with Yom Kippur and the ways you shine a light on, like, I'm kind of embarrassed that when we're in, I've been to short Yom Kippur services and I've been in multiple where we cut that half Torah, actually. Like you have to make a choice between like, are we going to do just the Torah reading or just the half Torah reading? I've been in spaces that don't do that. From my perspective, it's like, why don't we cut Kol Nidre? I mean, it's a different service. That's usually in the evening, whatever. But like, we're not making calculations about holidays based on how they best mobilize us. We're making calculations about other things. So I want to bring a weird analogy, which is like, there's TV networks, and they, they have time slots, and they have to put programming in certain time slots. I feel like what we're doing in Jewish life is we're burying social justice work in like Saturday late night time slots. I don't, I don't mean literally Saturday. I mean, like, we're burying it in time slots that not a lot of people watch TV, right? Like the things that get the main must-see TV Thursday slots, that's like Passover seders, Shabbat dinners. That It's things that are wonderful, important things, but they're usually not primarily anchored on mobilizing us to act in the world. They're about, like you said, community, having people gather together. Um, I don't want to say they're navel-gazing. They're not. They're really important and I value these things. But I feel like what you're arguing for is moving us to a place where being in the streets and calling for justice, that's not something we do in between in the buried time slots when it's the infomercials airing at two in the morning because they have nothing better to air. No, that should be the primary focus. That should be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday evening when the most people are watching TV, when the most Jews are doing a certain thing. So I guess I'd love to hear what's the intervention here into the default settings of how Judaism is structured, whereby fasting on Yom Kippur gets like a Wednesday evening centered time slot as one of the most important things to do when all the ratings are high and actually channeling Isaiah 58 to make sure that we feed those who are hungry and house the homeless. Sure, that's Jewish, but it's like Jewish at a time not a lot of people are watching. Yeah. Um, I'm ordained as a rabbi. I don't have antipathy towards rabbinic Judaism. What I'm asking for and what I'm um, proposing is that we hold rabbinic Judaism accountable to the very best of its values. These ideas are not Uh, alien. They're not foreign to Judaism. These are the core of the rabbinic texts, but how are we engaging with them, right? We have this question, what's greater, study or action? And the response seems to be study because it leads to action. But how much action is it really leading to? And if it's not leading to action, Mm -hmm. where have we missed the mark? Where has the blockage happened? I was once sitting in a, a lecture where Uh, a Muslim professor uh, from Duke uh, said this kind of offhanded line that has really stuck with me when when he he said, capitalism is the world's largest religion, right? If we think of religion as 
the reasons we do things. Who are we as human? How do we spend our time? How do we prioritize what we do in the world, right? This kind of external structure that we live in is uh, defining the vast majority of our of our choices in a kind of assimilated contemporary modern world where, at least in North America, as Jews, we are able to kind of dissolve into the broader fabric when I think what actually our religion is doing is calling us towards these kinds of radical act, radical as in radish, as in root, as in really transforming the root systems and embodying the very best of what our religion has to offer, right? Like we're not saying make up a new Haftarah for Yom Kippur. We're saying the Haftarah already exists. How do we actually embody it. We're not saying come up with a new practice at the beginning of Passover to invite in the stranger. We're saying it's already there. We're just not really living into it. And it's hard. We we don't have the structures in place at this point that support it. It's not an individual failure to say, oh, well, I haven't gathered with 50,000 of my closest friends across the country on this particular day to show up for X, Y, or Z. It's that we've inherited a, a structure of Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, that seems to, even despite its own claims, place far more emphasis on the words, on the text, on the studying, on the debate, on the back and forth, on the, the words of liturgical prayer, as opposed to saying, actually, Judaism is a guidebook to how we actually live our lives, how we embody the values that seem to be at, at its core. So I'm not uh, by any means saying to disrespect rabbinic Judaism. It's really, on the other hand, it's like rabbinic Judaism in some ways maybe has served its purpose of distributing these ideas of um, enriching these ideas through debate and commentary and all of the things. But now that we live in a globalized world where the demands on us are to uh, ensure that we have a livable and not just a livable, but like a beautiful and, um, you know, ecstatic uh, future, how can we actually turn to um, the prophetic tradition within our own religion to hold the rabbinic tradition accountable and and inspire us to actually live that out. You know, based on the data that that I'm aware of, about 25% of American Jews engage in kind of mainstream Jewish organizational life. That means 75% roughly don't. And at the same time, roughly 75% of Jews hold uh, some sort of democratic progressive values of doing good in the world, uh, believe that climate is an issue, believe that reproductive justice is a value, right? We have 75% of American Jews who don't engage in organized Jewish life and who hold these values of doing good, the kind of tikkun olam that we were taught growing up um, if we grew up Jewish and in Hebrew school or whatnot. And not to say that those are exactly uh, different or distinct groups, but some mix of that 75% is people who don't engage at all in showing up to hear the Haftarah on Yom Kippur and yet are motivated by quote unquote Jewish values of doing good in the world, of being a part of the kind of healing of the world that uh, I think so many of us existentially feel is kind of the only choice at this point. So in that regard, I'm curious why you talk about what you're doing. And by the way, like I say this in a sense that like I, I actually agree with you about this being the next era of Judaism, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I don't say this is a challenging question, but as a uh, to pull, pull out more and to think about it myself, why do you say that this is a new era, a uh, post-rabbinic, a non, you know, a, a something else, not rabbinic Judaism era, as opposed to like a reboot, a refresh of rabbinic Judaism? Because in a way, what I hear you saying is, hey, rabbinic Judaism has a lot of the tools that we need. It's just that like it's gone wrong. You know, like my question is like maybe we just we we are, you know, you call this late rabbinic Judaism. I mean, I wonder if it's just a crappy rabbinic Judaism and late, early, I don't know, but we should just like reboot it and make it better. W what makes the distinction between rabbinic and non-rabbinic? I think part of the response to that is that it's already happening. The Freedom Seder happened in 1969. There's been decades of the birth of the Jewish climate movement, of the movement for reproductive justice, and the reality on the ground that the vast majority of American Jews don't feel accountable to what the Shulchan Aruch, you know, rabbinic coda of laws says, you know, are people keeping kosher because someone a thousand years ago said that that's important or keeping the strictures of Shabbat because someone said that's important? I, I don't think that has hold on most American Jews. The data seems to suggest it certainly doesn't. And yet the values that underlie why those things might be important. What do our food choices reflect 
of our values? How can our food choices actually be part of a healing of food systems and a valuing of life? How can Shabbat actually be an invitation to experience sacred time, to create a relationship of holiness and wonder with the world around us and with the people around us? Sure. Part of it could be a branding and kind of marketing choice that rabbinic Judaism has kind of lost its luster. And late stage rabbinic Judaism is uh, out of touch and therefore a new era is needed. But more so, it's trying to identify a trend and a reality that that I see and that we see already happening and, and offering a name and a framing to it, not separate from our tradition, but actually invoking the parts of our tradition that forever have said, listen, the raw materials of this stuff is really good. Actually, our life, our sustenance, the sustainability of our world, our happiness, all actually depend on us uh, living in alignment with divine will. And we're not doing it. And we're suffering the consequences because of it. This was the role of the prophets. And most of the time, they weren't listened to. Most of the time, they were regarded as these outsiders who didn't know what they were talking about or were being too hard on the people or were out of touch with the realities of the day. And yet we're still striving towards that world of wholeness that the prophets were trying to hold our people accountable to. And that uh, the kind of emergence of a Jewish left or the Jewish social justice movement has been trying to do for the last number of decades. And I think what we're trying to do is, is say, how can we even move that from a social justice movement to a sacred justice movement? How can we tap into the sanctity of our holidays and of the calendar cycle and, and embody that in a way that transforms things? Since the very beginning, literally episode one of this podcast, we've been really interested in the question of trying to change existing organizations in Jewish life versus starting up new organizations in Jewish life. And there are major pluses and minuses to each of those strategies. And it's not that at any point, I think we've ever said, like, they shouldn't both be happening in some form. But we have, as a podcast, largely featured voices from folks who are starting up new things. And we've emphasized the ways in which when you try to change longstanding, I'm going to use the phrase legacy organizations, that's the phrase that is often used in Jewish life. Interestingly, for this conversation, I think it usually is code for centrist organizations like Jewish federations, et cetera, that are meant to convene Jews across political difference and often across demographic difference too. The Shalom Center, you could argue it is or isn't a legacy organization. It is 40 years of history. That's that's legacy. So in my view, it's a legacy organization. And many of the challenges that apply to changing other kinds of legacy organizations also apply here. And a strategic question I have is, let's say you're a listener out there and you're like, this is great. Love the activists. Love the strategic ideas that are coming up. Love the emphasis on holidays. It might be better for us to do this through a bunch of new organizations. And this, by the way, I think it's also happening and the Shalom Center is connected to these folks. But people could argue like, if not now is a relatively new project that has done a lot of channeling of holidays into a particular set of geopolitical conflicts. There are other organizations largely influenced by the Shalom Center that have been newer and done that. And we might be able to to do some of this work without some of the challenges of, oh, we, we've got a lot of assumptions by people of what this organization is. They assume certain things demographically about who is and is not involved. What's the reason that this work that we agree needs to be done can be achieved really well through an apparatus that has 40 years of history, as opposed to like, we could start up activists from scratch with a new name. There is a strategic choice at play here, which doesn't feel like a choice, but doing this within an existing organization comes with some challenges and some upside. And so I want to interrogate, like, why do it in that framework and not just in other sort of startup-ish kinds of frameworks? We see the various crises, climate, patriarchy, white supremacy, economic exploitation, et cetera, et cetera, as symptoms, symptom crises of a root spiritual crisis. That until or unless we heal and transform the root spiritual crisis, the symptoms will continue to find ways to transmute and do harm onto people. That's been the analysis from the very beginning. And we deeply believe that that analysis still holds. So that approach of trying to get to the spiritual crisis that underlies the manifestations of them in the world, that that's still a necessary and powerful approach. And so there's a sense of continuity there of this is, this is the approach and it's always been the approach and this is what we continue to try to do. 
I think there's another piece which I really deeply believe in, inspired by a verse from Malachi, from uh, from the prophets, that talks about the hearts of the youth and the elders turning towards each other. That to avoid the crisis, to avoid the sun destroying us all, it's actually incumbent upon uh, us as both youth and elders to turn towards each other. And that's another part of this project, not the kind of explicit part, but um, the kind of the context or the process of this, which is a deep, resounding belief that the elders have great wisdom to share and great wisdom to learn, and that the youth have great wisdom to share and great wisdom to learn, and that it's actually the collaboration, it's actually the the being in the midst of the crossfade generationally um, that will allow us to continue to seek out those seed crystals and place them strategically and inspirationally and effectively, um, that it, we actually gather a good part of our strength and our perspective from being in deep relationship uh, across the generations. And that's really a microcosm of this larger project of being in the tradition of the prophets, being in the tradition of the rabbis, being in the tradition of Adam, the first human, as the sun was setting on that first night, being scared of whether uh, whether day will come again. That this is a lineage, this is a continuity project, but in a very different way than maybe uh, we think about Jewish continuity most often in the in the Jewish world. Yeah, I want to bounce an idea off you. There's a thought that I've been thinking about in terms of. Some of the stuff that we see, particularly in the kind of Jewish renewal adjacent world, and clearly the Shalom Center, Arthur Waskow, is more than Jewish renewal adjacent. Uh, but I actually more and more am coming to feel like they're right. Like that's the that's the form of Judaism. That's a version of the form of Judaism that we need right now that will be what people need putting certain parts of the fabric back together of the spiritual and the intellectual elements of Judaism going on. But a lot of where we've seen that work happen was in these kind of 1960s, 1970s, counterculture type folks who people, frankly, like me and others kind of say, like, I'm really attracted to that. But does that mean that I have to grow a really long beard and wear a really big kippah? You know, I don't want to. That's not me. But it feels like when I go to a gathering of this kind of Judaism that I am attracted to, most of the other people are, are kind of like that. And so it makes it feel like, oh, it's too bad because there's a form of Judaism that I think I could really connect to, but there aren't other people like me there. And I've come to learn that that's a classic problem of the diffusion of innovation that we think of as the issue of early adopters versus the majority. And that early adopters, you know, with technology, we think of them as these like nerdy engineers with slide rules and whatever, and they get really excited about a technology that most of the regular people can't actually use effectively. And then along comes someone like Steve Jobs, who finds a way to translate that technology into a form that people actually can access. And then all of a sudden that tips and takes off. And there's a way in which I... I'm hoping that what's sort of happening, and one of the ways that I've been putting together a lot of the pieces of some of the organizations that we've talked to over the years on Judaism Unbound is maybe even subconsciously, that's what they're doing. They're kind of creating a 2.0 version of that 60s, 70s counterculture, Havara, renewal kind of Judaism. And that's starting to to take hold. That's starting to really grab the attention of a lot of younger people, also older people who just, you know, like me, who who just kind of say like, yeah, that other thing wasn't really me, but I was attracted to a lot of it. So, and now all of a sudden, th here's this thing I am attracted to. And it turns out it's actually kind of that in a new packaging. So I'm just sort of wondering what you, what you make of all that and, and how the Shalom Center as an organization really founded by, you know, one of those guys could do something that you often think of as something that is not what organizations do, which is that it kind of is able to change the way that it goes about things so that it, it's able to make that leap to that 2.0 version. So a uh, snapshot of 13-year-old Nate DeGroote. We joined the conservative synagogue in our area for just the year of my bar mitzvah so that we had a space and a cantor to teach me how to chant Torah. We had our Jewish renewal rabbi friend playing guitar on the bima on the the raised surface where the the service happens uh, at this conservative shul on Saturday morning where instruments had never been allowed before. It's the first time they had had it. And then our Chabad rabbi was the life of the party that night. 
balancing a chair on his chin, dancing around. And it took place in a barn overlooking an apple orchard. I'm sorry, balancing a chair on his this chin? Was, this was a celebratory... I'd like yeah. pictures for the show notes if you do have them. If you don't, that's okay. Yeah, I'd have but... to... I'd have to go through some photo albums or something. These weren't, uh, you know, weren't on the on the smartphone. But um, right, that's kind of the snapshot of where I, where I come from, and kind of combines the Hasidic Chabad with the renewal, you know, kind of break off of that with the nature base at the farm, with with all of these kind of creative and the and the mainstream conservative shul all kind of mixed and jumbled together. Um, I went to rabbinical school at Hebrew College, which is really in many ways rooted in a kind of neo-Hasidic orientation. And so these have been kind of elements that have been alive in me and helping to shape and direct my Judaism. And a, a piece of history that I, I think a lot of people may not know is that Arthur, based in Philadelphia, was was very close friends with Reb Zalman, who uh, is seen by many as the kind of grandfather, founder of Jewish renewal. Reb Zalman had this kind of deep spiritual renewal side of things. Arthur had this kind of fiery activism side of things. And they were very close. And they actually realized that each had a really important piece of the puzzle for the other. They're coming together and, and actually merging Paneor, Reb Zalman's community, and the Shalom Center is, is what established Aleph, which became uh, the Alliance for Jewish Renewal. And there's stories and, and you know, uh, ups and downs with that. But but I think what's um, so important there is that actually it's this fusion of the deep spiritual and the, the activist. I think one without the other is not going to work. It's not actually what our tradition, I would argue, and I think many of your listeners might argue, you know, it's not actually what Judaism intends. They're actually, they're inherently related to each other, right? We have Shabbat so that we can try to perfect the world the other six days of the week. Though just having Shabbat or just perfecting the world, they don't work uh, separate from each other. And that to me is kind of the chidush, the kind of new, and it's not new, it's it's ancient, it's forever. But in this moment, what the at least the new focus or the, the new kind of emphasis has to be on the fusion of those two things. As a byproduct, I think what you're talking about will happen, that more and more Jews are engaging in that and will engage in that. But that really is, to me, the byproduct. The The purpose is to be building the world of dignity and love and abundance and wholeness that uh, I think so many of us yearn for deep in our bones. But it's keeping those two things uh, interlocked and dancing with each other that I think is the, the secret sauce of our religion and the secret sauce of you know where, where we're headed. So I want to synthesize a couple of elements that have come up recently as a closing kind of question slash note. And it's also, it's a bit of a call to our listeners too. I think part of my question where I asked about older organizations and newer organizations, startups versus legacy, whatever, you approached that from the importance of folks who are younger finding deep value in those who are older, folks who are older finding deep value in those who are younger, and the, the back and forth, the in-between, the learning of those groups. I think we are heirs in the recent Jewish past, like the last 10, 20 years, of a Jewish institutional world that was hyper interested in segmentation, in this is going to be an organization either explicitly or implicitly that is almost entirely for young people in their 20s. This over here is going to be an organization that is by and large implicitly or explicitly anchored on people in their 60s and up. We are heirs to that tradition, and there's not a lot of spaces that are crisscrossing that. And similar, we're heirs to a situation where like the big Kipa people with the beards and the flowy, beautiful colors set up a thing over here, and the people that might be a little less bright colors in their clothing are in a different place. My call to everyone is, I guess it feels important to me as somebody who first felt exactly what Dan said. Like, when I first set foot in, in Jewish renewal spaces, I felt so other than what that space was. At the time, I was shortly out of college. I was substantially younger than most of the people in the room. I felt myself to be not woo, to use a word that is often used. I learned very quickly. It was not a long process. Like, once I gave those contexts a chance, I was deeply, profoundly moved by them. And not only did I find a way to sort of feel comfortable on their turf and with the bright colors, and I now wear maybe a little bit more bright colors as a result. And I like 
I also think that when more of us do that who don't just look like the expectation of that space historically, we actually serve a change in those space that makes other people feel more comfortable in them. I think we're at a point where the needs of our world are so urgent that we have to push ourselves when we feel that recoil of like, you know, I like these spaces values, but it feels not me. Part of why I'm excited that I recently joined the board of the Shalom Center is that I think it is a likely space where a lot of that can happen. Arthur Wasco is not just an elder. He's a person who specifically has impacted like a lot of millennials, actually. Like, like he, he specifically, I mentioned If Not Now before, like when you ask younger activists in Jewish life some of their historical anchors, he and the Shalom Center are often directly cited. And that makes this a context that in the whole ecology of Jewish life, I'm not going to say it's unique, but it is special in that it already has some of those age demographics present. It already has some of the big keep of people and smaller keep of people and no keep of people, by the way. That's so important. And so my closing, it's more of a call than a question, but like my closing call question, question call to you, Nate, is like, I guess I'm sort of asking you to address this to listeners. Like if they're the person that has come close to being part of some of this work, but hasn't quite jumped in fully, or if they've jumped in a little, but they could go more, what might you call on them to do to take those next steps? I think the segmentation that you're describing is spot on. And I think that is um, part and parcel with the larger society that we're living in. That Enlightenment era scientific method break things down into their smallest component parts when what is so desperately needed is the more holistic approach. I think there's another um, kind of hinge that is in all of this that you haven't necessarily talked about, a potential dividing line, right? There's the kind of aesthetics or norms of the kind of Jewish groups that this might be located in or, or historically has been. I think there's also the kind of activism side of things, the protest side of things for the people who say, I'm not an activist. I'm not going to be in the street. I don't mm -hmm. actually like activism, right? Those kinds of things. And, and for that, I really want to emphasize that what we're imagining as activism is related deeply to a provocation by a public intellectual named Bayo Akomalafe, who has been speaking for a couple of years now about post-activism, a framework that he offers with a question of what happens if our response to the crisis is part of the crisis? What happens if the way that we're demanding justice actually reinforces the very structures of injustice that we think we're protesting against? We're trying to shift the way that we understand activism too, right? In the Yom Kippur, this is the fast example. There's there's no angry shouting. There's no standing across a stanchion holding cardboard signs telling someone how wrong they are. This is really about how do we show up embodying the values um, in ensuring and increasing the well-being of the people around us, showing up as our as our full selves, uplifting grief, uplifting celebration, uplifting care and kindness as the substance uh, of what activism looks like. I think the call comes from our narrative of the exodus from Egypt. I think for many people in the kind of Jewish social justice world, uh, the exodus story has become the central narrative of our people, this understanding of a people oppressed and enslaved, breaking free into the expanse of wilderness of what's to come. Ariel Angel of Jewish Currents wrote uh, about that maybe not being enough, actually, that maybe we're actually not holding ourselves accountable enough if that's the story that we're relying on. Because of the Passover Seder, every year, those who are participating dip their pinky finger or uh, the knife or the fork into the wine and put a drop of wine, which is to symbolize a drop of blood for all of the mythical ancient Egyptians who died um, so that the Israelites could be free. And in the future that we're imagining, that's actually not possible. That's actually not okay. It's not permissible to allow a certain number of casualties to be had so that we, whoever the we is, can be free. It's going to have to be all together. And in Ariel's writing, I was introduced to a poem by Aurora Levens Morales, who talks about the crossing of the sea and that it's actually upon us to carry each other across. That's the moment that we're in. And I think it's upon us to decide whether we're going to settle for a religion, a tradition that allows for others to 
be left behind, to die, to be sacrificed for our own liberation, or whether we're willing to experiment and try and show up together uh, as messy as it might be, as imperfect as it might be, but also as expansive and inspirational and um, exciting and celebratory as it might be to figure out a way that our liberation is truly all together. That's our opportunity. Thank you so much, Nate DeGroote, for joining us. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thanks for having me. And thanks so much to all of you out there for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation and we hope that you'll tune in again in the future. A reminder, please, please head to judaismunbound.com slash classes. That's where you go to find out and register for our amazing courses in the Anyashiva that begin in just a couple days. Honestly, if you're listening to this episode after the first day it came out, it's uh, potentially that these classes are starting literally right now as you're listening. So head to judaismunbound.com slash classes, sign up for one of our awesome spring 2024 courses, and uh, there's financial aid available if you need it. Don't hesitate. Head to judaismunbound.com slash classes. Now, as we close, we, of course, want to encourage you to be in touch with us, and there are a wide variety of ways for you to do that. First, there's our Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook handles. All of those are at Judaism Unbound. Second, you can head to our website, JudaismUnbound.com, to check out show notes for this episode, other resources, all sorts of goodies. Third, you can email us at Dan at JudaismUnbound.com or Lex at JudaismUnbound.com. And last but not least, we are deeply appreciative if you're able to support us with either a monthly recurring donation or just a one-time gift, which you can do via JudaismUnbound.com slash donate. So thank you so much for listening. And with that, this has been Judaism Unbound.